So the two readings we're covering today are um, Manifesto of a Feminist Killjoy by Sara Ahmed, as well as a documentary which has been directed by, by Shoni Kosh. So uh, before we start, I'll just briefly introduce the uh, the pieces as well as the authors. So a Feminist Killjoy has been written by Sara Ahmed, who is a queer British Australian writer. And she writes mainly on lesbian feminism, queer theory, post-colonial studies, and so on. She is half Pakistani and half English. And um, the, the book that we are reading is actually a chapter, uh, is, is one chapter. And it was it was published in 2017 and it was converted from her blog, which she regularly posted on before that. And um, the other the other doc, the documentary is by a professor at uh, DU, uh, Professor Jamia, and she is a professor in mass media communications. And she specializes in work on gender and sexuality. Um, okay, I think let's start with the re- with the with the reading, Feminist Killjoy. So um, yeah, does anyone have any initial thoughts about the reading? Yeah. So. Uh the reading i think is uh, i found it like it is setting some standard for someone to be a feminist killjoy it's, it's, it's setting rules about what are the list of things that they need to have like the tools and everything and i found it but i'm i'm not a feminist or i mean i, I can't describe myself as feminist anyway but i found that this is like setting a structure would be it's confining people to set standards that they would not wish to follow sometimes. Like, uh, like when she says, we are not meant to be happy about things, but there are certain kinds of happiness that do not uh, question morality or, or the ethics. So that's that's what I think about the reading. Okay, Mandi? Uh, yeah, I thought it was really interesting. First of all, the fact that um, the author referred to um, feminist uh, feminism as a killjoy survival kit because that is a term that is often used for feminists killjoys and um yeah i like that she touched upon the fact that feminists have to be inventive to survive which also kind of relates to the documentary the where the sex workers do what they do because they need to feed and clothe their families and yeah how others not so much when a whole world is organized to promote your survival um you do not have to be inventive in order to survive and uh, your privilege becomes a sort of buffer zone. So you have something to fall back on when you lose something and it doesn't mean you're invulnerable. Things will happen to you. However, privilege can reduce the cost of that vulnerability. You're more likely to be looked after, which is uh, unfortunately a privilege us feminists do not have. Okay, so Mani mentioned something about you know survival and I think um, I think Amit also makes this point about how um, Survival is when is is when society doesn't want you to exist, and survival doesn't simply mean just eking out an existence. It can also be sort of a defiance against society, right? And that's something that the documentary really proves because uh, sex workers are on the fringes of society, and just their mere ex- their mere existence is something which is a survival because it goes against what societal norms tell us to do. And that could also be a reason why they are sort of villainized and they are constructed to be monsters in a way, right? So yeah, let's talk about more about how um, they are, how sex workers are considered. Sex workers are considered to be monsters, and why are they considered to be monsters? Is any does anyone want to add anything here? I think it's because the work they do is not considered morally acceptable by the wider public, and um, one of the sex workers when she is telling her story she's like what makes our work any different from um, what housewives do like because the housewives also to feed their children and to keep the family going they um, sleep with their husbands and the husbands provide for them so the sex worker is like what what makes what i do anything different from what they do like at least i'm getting to choose who i sleep with and i do this to still feed my children um, so what makes this any less immoral? Uh, there was this uh, one point uh, in the movie that I thought was very interesting where one of the sex workers says that people who sort of ostracize them or condemn them uh, have uh, what they called high-born impatience, which basically um, I thought was very interesting that they can afford to be uh, impatient or they can afford to have such uh, you know dismissive views about the work they're doing, whereas uh, sex workers, even if this isn't, uh, their first choice or work or if this isn't what they would ideally want to do, they still have to be patient and they have to uh, keep at it because at the end of the day, that's the only work that they're getting. So caste also comes into play quite a bit uh, when it comes to sex work. 
definitely i agree with that completely um it's just i think sex work is so stigmatized in general and especially in indian society um to the point where there's a, a bit of an awkward conversation in the documentary where um there was an event happening and one woman was talking to the sex worker and she told her to dance and the sex worker said i don't dance i only know how to have sex and then she said well there's uh i'm paraphrasing and well you know we can all have sex you know there's nothing special about that and then the sex worker said yes but i am better i mean that just shows the stigma people can have towards their line of work and yeah it's there's also a caste aspect to it because i remember when they were showing um women performing the play tales of the night fairies one of the dialogues was i am that woman i am that low caste village girl from bihar to step on whose shadow in the light of day is forbidden by religion but who in the night is dragged from her hovel to your bedroom and going back uh, to the documentary right the the entire i think the idea of immorality which harshita touched upon um when when initially they're trying to talk about in a public place the sort of trying to educate people about sex work there's one man who who talks about how you're trying to equate um sex work to honest work right he says he says just look at how uh, ram made sita walk through a fire to prove that she was pure now you're trying to say that sex work is legitimate work that it's equivalent to other kinds of work and that kind of shows how we use this uh, notion of how you know uh, morality is declining in society or society doesn't really have any morals anymore we use it to justify a lot of bad behavior and a lot of um, lack of understanding towards sex work that is very i think interesting point is of transgenders and um how since they don't fit the binary that everybody uh, likes to put every person in of either a male or a female they uh, they are left off even worse and and uh, another thing that i really uh, found interesting from the movie was uh, the portrayal of male sex workers and how uh, he says that he uh, cannot be accepted because of his long hair because he has male pains and even though he would identify as a male males would not think of him as one of them so i think even that is very interesting as that your your identity is being decided for you instead of you being able to decide it for yourself which is a uh, relatively something that is more acceptable in a uh, higher society and also the fa- uh, coming back to morality the fact that th- these red light districts in uh, when when common people talk these areas are called forbidden areas or these areas are called areas for fallen women and there was also a sign on one of the houses that said that only um uh it said that only moral people only decent people live in this house and then the question of who lives in the other houses then was asked by one of the sex workers so this shows a lot about how society feels about this kind of work like the idea of morality is why they are the other or the monster okay so um i just like to go back to the to the reading for a little bit right and try to link it to the documentary so in in your guys' opinion would you would you consider like at least the dmc the the dmsc this collective of uh, sex workers to be killjoys using the definition that the author gives in the piece they definitely qualify as being the killjoy because they're going against these ideas of um they're going against what society wants they are willing to create um they're willing to create disruptions in the institution and they're willing to create unhappiness because they choose to speak up about these things and just to be able to even speak up about these things it took like so long for them to spread awareness to be able to make the sex workers feel comfortable enough to listen to them or have a conversation with them and then after all of that there was the barriers of the state not listening to them or trying to suppress their voices so i think they definitely fall into the category of the killjoys because um, they had to go through so much just to talk about these things or to um, do something about it that was affecting their human rights yeah but i think otherwise it's i don't think they completely fall in the category of killjoy cuz cuz in 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 one of the principle it says i'm willing to risk my happiness for the for the for the for a system that is unjust and violent or unequal yeah but they're not risking their happiness they're just just trying to make their identity more more equal to what's outside they're trying to make themselves uh like like a normal a normalizing what what the work the kind of the kind of work they do but 
they did they did at some point like they, they made a make it a made a community like called the DMSC where well well the Killjoy has to come come form a community so they can support each other. So that part I agree like they they form a they come into the Killjoy. Okay, um just just one point. Um you said that they don't they don't risk their happiness, you know, to sort of challenge an unjust society. But um wouldn't you say that they are sort of risking their happiness every day in their profession? Like most of them, uh, most of them get into the profession itself because of exploitation, right? So I don't, I don't think that it's um, sort of a question of happiness in their case as well. It's a question of defiance as well, no? No, like okay, from the documentary, some of them had said that they came into this profession at their own will, and they do this because they enjoy it. So it's. It's not like they've been some of them, I mean, maybe have been forced into it. It's not that's not supposed to happen. But if they're doing it on their own will, then it's not like they're risking their happiness. No, but um, I would say they still are because I mean, even though like a couple of them were quite empowered with their profession at the same time, they also talked about the fact like one of them, Trigger Warning, talked about the fact that she was um, taken to a police station and one of the police officers brutally raped her and to the point where oh, she yeah, had yeah. slashes on her thighs and she herself was empowered with her profession she even said that um what's wrong with what i'm doing i'm like enjoying two of the greatest pleasures in life food and sex but that still doesn't mean that she deserved that kind of treatment that doesn't mean she deserved for that to happen to her so although they're mm-hmm. empowered with their profession there are serious uh, flaws in the system as well which they are up to that which they go through unfortunately yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with Mommy, and I think that maybe we need like a more holistic definition of the killjoy as well, right? Not just stick to whatever principles that she's put, maybe expand it as well, because because at least from what I understood about the definition, it's it's not really it's it's not really about the particularities of each of the principles that she lays down. It's more about um, it's it's more about people who are othered in society as well, and people who kind of dare to still fight for their rights and still fight for their visibility completely yeah it's like it again it goes back to uh, what the reading says that um, you know feminists have to be inventive to survive in a system that is rooted against them and we see that with these women they're being inventive to survive they want to feed and clothe their families through this profession and some of them are empowered with their profession but that doesn't justify some of the atrocities they have to go through in the profession so the concept of feminism that um, Ahmed propounds in her reading is one of everyday feminism, right? It's finding uh, moments of power within the small moments. So within that context, I think I think we should also talk about the significance of the word killjoy, right? Um, it's not something that is really a source of empowerment. It's supposed to be an insult, but she describes herself as a killjoy, someone who's constantly trying to sort of cause uh, change sort of cause violence and she uses um, the example of a manifesto a manifesto where you sort of where you sort of call for a complete upheaval of a system and within that context I think we can talk about um, the entire idea of an angry feminist you know not just an angry feminist but an ugly angry feminist and um, in popular culture especially the way that feminism has come to be represented is sort of this whining uh, person who's always looking to poke holes in what someone is saying, trying to take the humor out of the situation. Uh, yeah, completely. I mean, I know in my daily life, I have often been referred to as an angry feminist. If I point out a casually sexist joke a friend of mine has made, then I have also been referred to as a killjoy and an angry feminist. And I've also heard people use the term feminazis for people who just point out sexist comments in everyday life. And it can be extremely frustrating and taxing, which is why I enjoyed the reading so much, because she's kind of reclaiming power in the term killjoy by calling ourselves killjoys and being proud of the fact that we are quote unquote killjoys because we're continually, you know, fighting against sexist systems of power and sexist hierarchies. And yeah, I like that she sort of reclaimed that power and to me it seemed kind of reminiscent to how um the black community in america has reclaimed the power of the n-word they use it um as a term towards each other it's not okay for other people to use it but for them it's uh, they've sort of reclaimed power with that word okay so while we're talking about you know um black people in america i think that we can also talk about the entire um sort of the construction of the angry black woman as well right as a monster and this i think is something that 
it has been used like for a very long time. They did it to Michelle Obama. They're doing it to Jada Smith and so on. And just like the angry feminist, again, it's the construction of a monster. And it kind of tries to undermine um, the power that women have tried to reclaim for themselves. So yeah, does anyone have any comments on this? Yeah, I mean, I remember when uh, the whole Oscars controversy happened where Will Smith punched Chris Rock. A lot of people uh, said that, uh, you know, Jada took the joke too seriously and like Chris Rock makes comments about this all the time and people should watch, you know, comedy roasts and they roast people way harder. But the fact of the matter is that, um, you know, he joked about I think an autoimmune condition she has alopecia which causes hair loss she was upset by it but then her husband went and punched Chris Rock yet Jada was still blamed to a large extent because she got offended about the joke in the first place even though she didn't do anything about it so yeah, yeah that really feeds into the angry woman trope we keep focusing on her face to show that it was her expression because of which he acted but it's still his act it's not exactly exactly act. I mean, while we're talking about media and popular culture, I think it's also very um, messed up how they show how sex workers are portrayed in the media. Like, even if even in movies or in video games, like if you look at Grand Theft Auto, you see that these sex workers are being dehumanized. They show rape and they show murders of sex workers. And that's supposed to be the main thing that happens to them in movies or in these um, popular things people use, right? And in our, in the minds of the public, this is something that's normalized so much, and that plays out in real life too a lot. Like because you see it so much, or maybe like it happens in real life, and that's why it's shown in popular culture. I don't know, but it's very messed up that the stories of these people from their own mouths, like their own voice, comes out so little, and you see these portrayals so much more often. Yeah, for sure. So I think I think what the, the media and popular culture are collectively done to both, you know, feminists as well as sex workers has made them out to be an other and made them out to be a monster. And also, I think that the word killjoy, it's also, it's just an exa- another word that we can use for othering. Because from what we've learned in this course, othering is simply someone who's on the fringes of society, someone who doesn't sort of fit, uh, spit in, someone who's used to um, collectively define the rest of society, right? And um, that's that's sort of what feminists and sex workers have provided for society to define themselves a call against this other based on morality. And especially when you look at, uh, like, like Mandy said, when you look at the word kill join, even when we use it to uh, define sex workers, there's a reclaiming of power in this world. And I think by extending it, you know, at least for us, at least for women who are who are watching the documentary, reading the piece now, we don't we don't see them as the monsters. We've sort of reclaimed it to see them as the heroes. Just one more thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I remember how in class we defined um, the other as something that was abnormal, and then we had after that we further dissected what the term abnormal is, what consists of normal, and what consists of abnormal. And it's very interesting that feminists fighting just for equal rights between people are considered abnormal and the fact that sex workers having to get into their profession to feed and sustain their families are considered abnormal so they are othered 